Um, EPSRC has been over the last few months trying to um, put down a sort of outcome based um, framework if you like to try and explain the benefits of long-term research how you invest in research to make the UK a prosperous nation and a successful nation so the connected nation is um, is one of those four aspects we've got so it's connected nation healthy nation productive nation and a resilient nation so connected is all around the digital infrastructure and, and making the most of the digital economy and the ICT and the maths and the data analytics there so through course of lots of iterations with our advisory bodies um, we've come up with basically five I guess you could say priority areas so they range from sort of quite um, heavy maths and ICT in terms of big data and big data analytics and how you can exploit big data to give you information and knowledge, which then could be exploited by companies to uh, get to give them a market advantage, to Internet of Things, where particularly we focused on the security aspects and trying to design in privacy from the start and looking at the whole ethical and people dimensions to do with Internet of Things, because what's it like to live in a society where everything is connected and every moment and every movement is being tracked and monitored? It would even know whether you're picking up utensils to cook a meal and that sort of thing. Uh, then, of course, you've got the whole thing about autonomous vehicles and autonomous robots and doing robots and sort of things autonomously doing stuff that might be hazardous or to help people live in their own home, sort of like an assisted living type thing. So there's a whole load of ethical things around that, about who designs the software, who takes responsibility if an accident happens, what are the insurance models, has anyone thought about the business models for that sort of stuff? And, and you know, huge interdisciplinary challenges there, not just the technology stuff. And then, of course, another big area in the connected nation is this whole trust, identity, privacy, security arena that um, encompasses everything from cyber security to the ethical dimension, responsible innovation, and uh, the whole thing to do with, you know, what's it like to be in a society where you are being monitored and what's it feel like and can we do things better that are ethically better for people. And then finally, uh, all those things sort of wrap up to what would it be like to live in, in a society where, say, in the future where we expect 70% of the world's population to live in cities, where you've got perhaps new digital currencies, uh, you might have distributed ledger technologies enabling people in communities to uh, have more democratic uh, rights and voting and things much more easily. But distributed ledger technology, which is the technology behind Bitcoin and virtual currencies, means that you could actually uh, engage with people more closely and better and more effectively so you you'd have local democracy digital civics if you like and um, so we think that's a huge opportunity and so how do, how do people in the future how will they live in a, in a smart city or future city how will digital civics be used how will future uh, virtual currencies be used how will you do your business in a digital environment so that's the sort of last one the digital society type thing really um, so at the moment we're just waiting to try and develop those themes further and to try and hope that in the implementation phase of our delivery planning that we can go ahead and really nail down some really exciting and compelling science over the next five years that will then galvanize the UK academic community together with the users and take that, that forward to me this event has been a culmination of probably several years of activity because it all came from a review of the, looking at the impact of the research we'd funded. And we started off looking at that in 2012 with an impact review panel led by Andrew Herbert, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because of some tragic circumstances. But then we asked Andrew again to uh, do an update of our impact review to try and see where we'd gone in the sort of two and a half or so years since our initial impact survey. So what we did, we surveyed the academic community who would fund it through the digital economy and got them to say what did they think were the major impacts on their work and what, were the, what did the users who they work with think of it as well. And um, so and from that we had Andrew and Carlos who was at the time from Aberdeen and now at Glasgow actually distill down some of the key projects, the projects that seem to have uh, become exemplars across the piece in digital economy and also ICT and they've been showcased today. So it's actually really hard to pick out some, you know, uh, I mean, one that's... Um, but, I mean, you know, I was talking to Mark Eiley from a few minutes ago and he, he wowed the impact panel a few years ago by his mapping of the Dar es Salaam slums, you, you know, using mobile phone data. I mean, Dar es Salaam, these, these slums and the, the country of, of, of Tanzania, 
uh, Dar es Salaam didn't have any maps beyond from 1961. So that's a major thing where you can actually find out where people live and work. But probably one of my favourite, if I had to pick a favourite digital economy project, uh, and maybe it's because Chris Speed is such a showman, but probably Chris Speed's telling tales of, um, the tales of things with electronic memories rather, the Totem project. And it's really interesting because not only did it come out of a sand pit, and a sand pit is where you bring together lots of people who don't necessarily know each other from different disciplines, different backgrounds, and they all work together over the course of a week on some really wacky problems. So it's really high risk research. And the, the, the issue that the sand pit was addressing was design in the digital world. And we've heard a lot today about design. And so the design in the digital world sand pit produced lots of actual projects, but the Totem project was, to me, a highlight. And the reason it's a highlight was because it was a real uh, Internet of Things type project, but it had a, a real commercial use at the end of the day, because the idea of the project was to associate memories with artefacts. So in other words, if you had a, I don't know, could be a dress, right? How, and you uh, work with Oxfam, and Oxfam were good, wanted to sell that dress to make money, how do you give it more value? So the case in point was that with Annie Lennox, who uh, wore a dress to Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday, she donated the dress for Oxfam, but she recorded a little vignette, a little video to say what was her story with it. But the, the Totem Project then allows that story to be captured, but you to add your story to that. So you could have gone into the Oxfam shop, scanned the QR code with it, up on your phone pops Annie Lennox telling you how she wore that dress to Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday. But you could then add your memory to that as well. She said, I bought this dress because I'm the world's biggest fan of Annie Lennox and the Eurythmics of whatever and love Nelson Mandela, whatever. And, you know, so you then start tagging an electronic memory with that artefact, gives it more value, therefore for Oxfam, that was more value, therefore more sales, more money, da da da. And Oxfam have commercialised that work that Chris Speed and his colleagues did, and it's called Shelf Life, and it's now been deployed in Oxfam shops. So it's, a, it's an example of high-risk research that's interdisciplinary but applied, actually focusing on a sort of problem, if you like, well, how can you design in electronic memories to things, and then it's gone out into the actual market and being used. Now, not every project works, your research is risky, but that's a really good one. But there are hundreds more, and you know, I could spend all day saying what they were, but, and that's why we've produced the document you know, about the, the digital economy and, and the highlights there. So. so from my perspective, the digital, say the digital economy in its broadest sense, has sort of come out of nowhere, really. I mean, five years ago, ten years ago, people didn't really talk about it. And, and you know, when I took over the job four years ago, people were still saying, well, what, what is the digital economy? And now everything's digital and people don't say, and it's the, the economy that's digital and it's what isn't digital these days. So when you extrapolate that and you think about the things that have come up now, talking about big data and the opportunities that the digitization of things enable lower transaction costs, enable information to be shared more easily, enable whole new forms of information to be passed about, whether it's just... Um, videos of cats on YouTube or whatever, but people are creating their own content now, they're distributing it, there are whole new business angles coming up, you know, whether it's uh, people bringing home their stuff they bought from the shops and putting it on video and then Google pay them for their clips and stuff, but this whole new business model has been created, whole new ways of doing business, whole new ways of delivering services, whole new ways of engaging with communities and people, and uh, whole new opportunities to, to do things better, cheaper, more effectively, and uh, you really give the UK a competitive advantage if we fund it properly, and if we work together, as we are doing, with other agencies like Innovate UK, other research councils like AHRC, ESRC, etc., and agencies like the Digital Catapult. And we're doing all that stuff now, but we just need to build on that, uh, build on the priorities we've identified, and try and work together coherently up and down the exploitation pathway and across the disciplines. So, it could be good. So to try and engage with researchers, I mean, the standard answer from EPSRC is we publish all our grants on the web so people can go and search them. There's uh, things like Research Fish and Gateway to Research. But the other thing is we are there, you know, we are people and we'd love to talk. And um, that's one thing I think EPSRC has made a real niche for itself is this 
ability to go out, engage with the community, make some really good interactions with users. And we work really powerfully and closely with agents like the Knowledge Transfer Network, with the Digital Catapult and the other catapults. So we're trying to create an ecosystem where people can tap into at various stages. And some of our calls we put out, uh, we have a requirement to engage with users. So we put the onus on the universities to then, when they come into the call, to actually go out and bring users in. So there's lots of opportunities for users and others to engage. But yeah, if, if it all comes to an issue, just pick the phone up or send an email and say, you know, I'm an SME, I'd like to engage, what's appropriate? It could be anything from an innovation voucher to a knowledge transfer partnership to a research grant to just putting someone in touch with someone for a little bit of well, almost free or cheap consultancy in the academic base.